Welcome doctors. Today is our third lesson of the nasal part in our syllabus. Today we will talk about inflammation or inflammatory disorders. We will start by the inflammation of the nasal cavity. Inflammation of the nasal cavity is classified into acute rhinitis or chronic rhinitis. Rhinitis is the Latin word for inflammation of the nose. Acute rhinitis, its definition is acute inflammation of the nasal mucosa. Its types are common cold, which we see every day around, it's also called coryza or influenza. What's the difference between common cold and influenza? Common cold is the causative organisms are several viruses, commonest are the rhino virus, but in influenza it is influenza virus types A, B or C. Both are transmitted by droplet infection. As for symptoms, in common cold, generally or general symptoms, we have a mild fever, a headache, anorexia, and malaise. And by local examination, nasal examination, we will see a vasoactive nasal obstruction, I, which means alternates from side to side and profuse, watery, or whitish nasal discharge. Again, what we see in a common cold patient, we will see or what the patient will complain of. What is the complaint of this patient? The complaint of this patient, his patient is coming to your clinic. Nowadays, common cold and influenza are very important to distinguish from COVID-19. Okay, so a common cold patient is coming to your clinic complaining of from a mild fever, headache, anorexia, and malaise, alternative nasal obstruction from side to side, and watery discharge. In influenza, it, all the symptoms are similar but more severe. Also, in COVID-19, we have the same now. We have the same symptoms for a common cold or influenza, but even severe more severe than the influenza or the normal the common influenza what we see as a doctor what is the sign what are the signs we know if we looked in the uh, the common cold the nasal mucosa is red and swollen and the nasal cavity is full of watery and mucoid discharge what about influenza the same but more severe, more congestion, more discharge. What are the complications of a common cold or influenza? For a common cold, a secondary bacterial rhinitis can occur. Secondary bacterial infection, another bacteria comes into the field. By symptoms, with bacterial rhinitis, the constitutional, constitutional symptoms become more severe. Remember the constitutional symptoms, the fever, the headache, the malaise, the anorexia. And the nasal symptoms will be even more aggressive, more obstructions, and the discharge change from uh, mucoid to yellowish, from whitish to yellowish. And when we examine the nose, the nose is more is dusky red and swollen, the nasal cavity is full of mucopurulent discharge. Also, as a complication, descending infection can happen. The, the infection transfers from the nasal cavity, from the nose to outside, to outside the nasal cavity. The closest are the vestibulitis outside the external nose, the sinuses, which are very close to the nasal cavity, otitis media through is taking tube pharyngitis by <clears throat> by the passage of the mucus from the nose to the nasopharynx to the oropharynx and from the pharynx to the larynx causing laryngitis 
What about complications of the influenza? It's the same as the common as the common cold, but also more severe and may cause. Remember that anosmia. Anosmia is now the very characteristic condition which is loss of smell in COVID-19 nowadays. So as influenza the complications of influenza are more severe than the common cold and may cause anosmia, labyrinthitis, vestibular neuronitis, meningitis, encephalitis, pericarditis, pneumonia, and gastroenteritis. Do you remember, these symptoms are very close to what we see nowadays from COVID-19. So, it's an, uh, they are alarming signs. How to treat common cold, which is very common, and you can see it as a general practitioner or an ENT doctor or, or an internal medicine doctor. So patient is coming and nowadays we see a lot because patients are aler alerted and afraid from the complication of COVID-19. So you see a lot of patients nowadays. So what to do? General, me general measures in common cold is give supportive measures, rest, fluid intake, lots of fluid intake, analgesics, antipyretics, decongestants, antibiotics if secondary bacterial infection occurs. So don't give antibiotics from the first day of a common, uh, for a common cold patient. If complications happen and you see the change of the color of the discharge, then you give antibiotics because antibiotics can decrease the immunity of the patient due to killing the normal commensals, which helps fighting the virus. Locally, what we do, we give nasal decongestants, steam inhalations. Okay. What about influenza? It's the same, but for influenza, there is vaccines prepared from prevalent strains of the virus. They are used during epidemics and it's important to give high-risk patients like elderly children, medical staff, and immunocompromised patients. What's the prophylaxis for both influenza, common cold, and even COVID-19? Avoid predisposing factors, avoid exposure to the sources of infection, avoid contact with patients, avoid, avoid using patients' towels, avoid overcrowding, you remember social distancing, it's now all, all over the world. No vaccine is available for the rhinoviruses or the common or the common cold infection. The available is antiviral vaccines consist of attenuating living bacteria. It does not prevent attacks but reduces the complications. Chronic rhinitis. It's chronic inflammation of the nasal mucosa. So it is divided into non-specific chronic rhinitis and specific chronic rhinitis granulomata. Non-specific chronic rhinitis are a hypertrophic rhinitis or atrophic rhinitis. Specific chronic rhinitis, the granulomata, are scleroma, the rhinoscleroma, the lupus vulgaris, vulgaris and syphilis. Hypertrophic rhinitis. It is caused by recurrent attacks of rhinitis or sinusitis, prolonged allergic or vasomotor rhinitis, septal deviation may cause hypertrophic rhinitis on the wider side. What are the symptoms? Bilateral nasal obstruction, bilateral mucoid or mucopurent nasal discharge. By examination or the signs, you will see hypertrophy of the nasal mucosa, especially the inferior turbinates. It does not shrink on application of vasoconstrictant solution, which indicates irreversible changes. How to treat it? Medically, we try to treat the cause and you can give steroids local sprays. If this doesn't work, you will go for surgical treatment by reduction of the size of the inferior turbinate by submucous diosermy, laser vaporization or partial resections called partial turbinectomy.
atrophic rhinitis. The etiology of atrophic rhinitis is primary atrophic rhinitis. No cause can be detected. It may be due to endocrinal disturbance like estrogen deficiency is suggested because it's common in females and usually starts at puberty and symptoms increase during menses. Maybe autoimmune disturbance, maybe may autonomic disturbance as nasal sympathetic overactivity causing vasoconstrictions and ischemia. Maybe infection, separative sinusitis in childhood. So, primary atrophic rhinitis, we have no cause. It's only theories. Endocrinal theories, autoimmune, endocrinal disturbance, autoimmune, autonomic disturbance, or infection. Secondary atrophic rhinitis, the cause can be detected at maybe infective, that nasal granulomata, which will be discussed later in this lesson as scleroma and syphilis iatrogenic like radiotherapy or total surgical excision of the inferior termite. Remember, we, in hypertrophic rhinitis, we do excision of part of the inferior termite, but if you totally excise the inferior termite, you can it can lead to atrophic rhinitis. What happened or what happened to get atrophic rhinitis or what is the pathology of atrophic rhinitis? It starts by endarthritis or periarthritis of the nasal terminal arterioles causing ischemia. After ischemia, atrophy happens of the nasal epithelium with destruction of the cilia and stasis of the nasal secretion. Cilia is important to expel secretion, so atrophy of the nasal epithelium and cilia will cause stasis of the nasal secretions. Atrophy of the nasal glands diminished nasal secretions forming of crusts so the change of the nasal secretions from a mucoid discharge to crustaceans atrophy of the nerves will cause anosmia and dullness of sensation of the air atrophy of bony turbulence wide roamy nasal cavity secondary infection by proteolytic saprophytic organisms as Klebsiella uzina cause putrefactions of the crust and production of a foul odor called uzina. So, what's uzina? Uzina is a foul odor in atrophic rhinitis patient due to the subprophetic organism Klebsiella uzina. Okay, after we knew the pathology, what is the complaint of this patient? Patient with atrophic rhinitis will come to the clinic complaining of a nasal nasal discharge. Remember, it is greenish, crusty, and uh, has a foul odor. Remember, uzina, nasal obstruction, nasal obstruction. How come, doctor? You just said it's wide nose. It's well, the nasal obstruction, in spite of the ruminous, due to accumulation of the crusts, dullness of sensation of air as a result. As a result of atrophy of the sensory nerve, the patient does not feel the air coming inside, so he's complaining of nasal obstruction, although he has a, a roomy nose. Anosmia, due to atrophy of the olfactory mucosa, the patient doesn't smell his own bad odor. So a relative or a wife or a husband can, can complain from his partner from the bad odor and the patient himself does not feel the odor. Epstaxis. The separation of crusts can cause bleeding, causing epstaxis from the nose. And when we examine the nasal cavity, you will find the roomy and the roomy nose lined with greenish offensive crusts, and the mucosa is pale, dry, and atrophic, and the turbinates are atrophic. How to treat atrophic rhinitis? Medically, we try to treat the cause in case of secondary atrophic rhinitis. Nasal douching with alkaline nasal lotion is very important to separate the crusts. Oily nasal drops as paraffin as, as a lubricant to prevent adherence of the new crusts and menthol nasal drops to mask the foul odor. Surgically, narrowing the, room, the roomy nasal cavity till the nasal mucosa regenerates. 
when to do that after failure of medical treatment to control the patient symptoms how we can do submucosal insertion of a graft as fat bone cartilage or teflon as the first figure or closure of the nostrils for 6 to 24 months by skin flaps from the vestibule watch the second figure Rhinoscleroma Rhinoscleroma is a very important disease why because it's a commonest specific infective chronic rhinitis granuloma in Egypt it's endemic in Egypt it's endemic in some areas as El Sharqiyya and El Qalyubiyya it's common <coughs> in females in the age for, from the age of 15 to 25 years and it starts in the nose called rhinoscleroma and may spread to the pharynx called pharyngoscleroma the larynx laryngoscleroma and the lacrimal pass passages called dacryoscleroma it is caused by an organism called Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis it, the mode of transmission is unknown it's only slightly contagious the pathology of this disease starts by stage of invasion similar to the acute non-specific rhinitis but the active stage is either atrophic or nodular form both may occur simultaneously atrophic form similar to atrophic rhinitis nodular form the submucosa is infiltrated by granulomatous tissue characterized by mucous cells large foamy cell with a central nucleus and vacuolated cytoplasm the vacuoles contain the Fritsch bacilli gram negative intracellular diplo bacilli these are pathognomonic of scleroma watch the figure showing the mucous cells containing the bacilli Russell bodies are bright red or oval or rounded bodies devoid of nuclei. They represent plasma cells undergoing hyaline degeneration, plasma cells and lymphocytes. So the pathology or the histopathology, we have <coughs> two important cells, the mucous cells and the Russell bodies. The mucous cells, the large foamy cell with the central nucleus and the vacuated sub cytoplasm containing the Fritsch diplo bacilli and Russell bodies which are showing the highline degeneration and they are bright red oval rounded bodies in the fibrotic stage healing occurs by extensive fibrosis clinical picture the stage of invasion at the stage of invasion similar to prolonged attack of acute non-specific rhinitis that does not respond to the usual lines of treatment so after you find a patient with rhinitis and it's not doesn't and he does not respond to medical treatment <clears throat> after a long period you should suspect a chronic inflammatory disease in the active stage it's either atrophic or nodular form both may be occur simultaneously the atrophic form similar to the atrophic rhinitis the nodular form you will have bilateral discrete reddish non ulcerating firm nodules appear at the mucocutaneous junction between the nasal cavity and the vestibule they spread and coalesce uh, to fill the nasal cavity and may broaden the nose fibrotic stage is concentric narrowing of the nasal cavity watch this photo those photos of the patients the rhinoscleroma with a broad nose and spreading to, to the lacrimal sac in the first figure what are the investigations done for a rhinoscleroma patient or for such a patient biopsy showed the typical history histological picture of scleroma and culture and sensitivity tests the treatment is by medical treatment antibiotics rifampicin 
300 milligram but <clears throat> twice daily or quinolone surgeon or third generation kephalosporins or better according to the culture and sensitivity tests done by investigation in the atrophic stage we all you are only treated as atrophic rhinitis when to <clears throat> go for surgical treatment when you go for surgical treatment to remove the granulomatous mass or the fibrous tissue better by laser surgery rhinoplasty can be done to correct the nasal deformities now we go to nasal lupus vargalis and nasal syphilis both are uncommon the nasal lupus is called by attenuated tuberculous bacilli the nasal syphilis is caused by treponema Pallidum organism. The nasal lupus vulgaris is a bilateral reddish alternating firm nodules appear at the mucocutaneous junction between the nasal cavity and the vestibule and also to the butterfly area of the face called apple jelly nodules, which are pathognomonic. Nasal lupus vulgaris can cause perforation to the cartilaginous part of the septum cartilaginous part of the septum remember that for nasal syphilis is the mode of transmission it's acquired it's either acquired or congenital acquired syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease congenital is trans uh, it's transplacental coming from the mother in nasal syphilis, in uh, acute syphilis, it may be primary, secondary, or tertiary. In the primary stage, you find something called chunker, which single chunker, which are single reddish firm papules in the vestibule of the nose. Secondary, you'll find a persistent rhinitis and ulcers, and third tertiary, which is the goma, which is single or multiple reddish rubbery ulcerating swelling that may lead to this is important perforation of the bony parts of the septum it's it, the, the goma of the cephalus perforate bone the <clears throat> the goma of the nasal lupus vulgaris perforate cartilage this is the difference so in nasal cephalus you'll find perforation of the bony Part of the nasal septum, perforation of the heart palate, coding oroantral fistra, depression of the nasal bridge, coding sudden nose deformity, or destruction of the cribriform plates of ismoid, causing cerebrospinal rhinorrhea. The treatment of nasal lupus vulgaris is, <coughs> is, uh, is medical treatment by antibiotic and anti tuberculous therapy and surgical treatment to removal of the, gran the granulomatous masses or the fibrous tissue better by laser surgery. Rhinoplasty operation can be done to correct nasal deformities or septal perforation can be done by septal repair. See both figures in lupus vagalis. Here is the septal perforation of the cartilage, and in syphilis you can see the perforation of the heart palate, the perforation of the bony septum, the destruction of the nasal bones. For congenital syphilis, early congenital syphilis. In the first three months, there is persistent rhinitis and vestibulitis with fissuring of the vestibule and the upper lip called snuffles. Lately, or late congenital syphilis, after the age of three years, similar to tertiary syphilis coding goma, other stigmata of congenital syphilis is the Hutchinson teeth, interstitial keratitis, and sensory neural healing loss called the Hutchinson, Hutchinson triad. What's investigation for syphilis? Serological tests for syphilis will show the treponema and pallidum immobilization. Biopsy shows the typical histological picture of syphilis and culture and sensitivity tests to see what antibiotics will be helpful for such a condition. The treatment, medical treatment, antibiotics by penicillin in the atrophic stage similar to atrophic rhinitis. For surgery we remove the granulomatous 
the matters by laser surgery, rhinoplasty, and reconstruction of the septal perforation or or fistula or the cerebrospinal rhinorrhea. The second lecture will be the inflammatory disorders of the paranasal sinuses, sinusitis, which is inflammation of the mucoperiosteal lining of one or more of the paranasal sinuses. Its types, acute sinusitis, chronic sinusitis, and fungal sinusitis. Thank you, and see you next lecture.